Okay, AP Bio. Well, here is your very last lecture. This one is fun. It's a little bit rambling. It has a lot of uh, rabbit trails and unique questions. And were we in class, I know you're tired of hearing this, we would have had a lot of side conversations, a few strange labs, and some fun self-survey type questionnaires to fill out to learn a lot about ourselves. Um, but nevertheless, I will try and make this as interesting as I can and not too long so that you can enjoy it. One of the first things we would talk about are the concept of emotions. And what's amazing is, is that emotions can be defined scientifically. The generation and experience of what we call an emotion uh, involves a lot of particular structures in the brain that I'll show you in a minute that you can see light up. But if you put these structures together, they're called the limbic system. And limbus means boundary. And what they are is it's a filter, it's a boundary, it's a collection of compartments in the brain that are kind of a barrier, maybe like an airport, train station, something like this, to process sensory input and decide where to send it so that you can have a perception, sensation, experience, or emotion. And so that's what the limbic system does this is kind of a sorting station for sensory input. So one of the amazing things about memory is not just memory of particular facts, but really the most powerful or important memory for the brain is emotional memory. And if you think about this, I bet you can't remember what you had last month on the first Tuesday for dinner. Um, I bet you can't remember what book you read maybe nine months ago. Um, maybe you do, I don't know, but I bet you can remember the first time you rode a bike, that first breakup, the first crush, the first time you drove a car. There was a powerful uh, emotion attached to it, like fear, excitement, sadness, or whatever. And these kinds of things are what really gets stuck in our brain, is emotional memory. And what an emotion is, as you'll find out in a minute, is a combination of sensory input with kind of pre-coded or pre-formatted um, uh, data, I guess, from previous experiences. So we usually have emotions about things that are really, really familiar. So um, anyway, we'll get to that in a minute, but emotional memory is a lot more powerful than just data being pulled from the brain. You remember things better if you have some sort of emotional attachment to it. Now in education, uh, teachers either instinctively or explicitly know this and the emotion that they usually attach to education if not excitement is fear and like there will be a test on this you better pay attention you better listen you better study uh, they're trying to scare you no teachers but some do um, and so it is more difficult to try and find a different emotion to attach to learning though the concept is really powerful and so um, that's my job i'm just letting you know that emotions affect memory pretty powerfully so here is the limbic system it's uh, nestled deep inside underneath the cerebrum but it's on top of what you might call the lower brain and so there's the parts to it and it literally lies in between and its function is to be a go-between between sensory input coming in from the spinal cord and lower brain and sending it to the right place in the cerebrum or higher or upper brain. So one of the cool things is to talk about chemicals and how they affect this process. Um, so you see some of these here where nicotine stimulates more dopamine being released. If you've ever taken cigarettes away from a smoker, they get depressed, they get sad, they get angry, they feel pleasure when they smoke. Um, Opium and heroin, which I hope that you really never have contact with, but there is an opiate crisis in our country. They decrease inhibitory neurons. So in other words, uh, there's more stimulation, but they lower pain is how they work. They, uh, they decrease the activity of that. Cocaine and methamphetamines will block the removal of dopamine, so they don't release more dopamine they just have the ability to keep the dopamine that you make in place longer and then so that you can understand how these might work and these chemicals have different effects on the brain overall i have to tell you be careful with your brain and how chemically um organized it is but that's what's so powerful dangerous 
and effective with these particular chemicals that are pretty common. So this brings up another topic or conversation we could have had about addiction. What is it? So the, the powerful thing about um, a lot of those chemicals is that they alter the dopamine pathways. In other words, how dopamine, that chemical that is released by the brain, how it's used, because that chemical is used to literally rewire the circuitry in your brain. So if, say, if you were a big smoker and then you got off smoking, you will always have the cravings. They will never go away because your brain has been permanently altered to release dopamine that way. And the likelihood is you'll struggle not only with addiction or, I mean, uh, cravings, but all the negative emotions that go with that as well. So if that doesn't scare you a little bit, I don't know what will, but I'm just trying to help you out so that you understand biochemically how this happens. Because the brain's reward system is used for a number of things, and we would talk about like what the survival mechanism is for certain emotions. Like the survival mechanism for happiness is, I like that, please do it some more, it's good for me. The survival mechanism of fear is, I don't like that, or maybe sadness, I don't like that, don't do that again, that scares me or I don't want to repeat that. Um, anger might be a survival mechanism for stay away from me, I'm dangerous, which really brings up a lot of problems with uh, expressing anger constantly to a lot of people. Um, what you're trying to say to them is, I'm going to harm you. Now, if you're not going to harm someone, but you're acting angry all the time, you've got a bit of a disconnect because you don't understand what that emotion is really used for. And so there's a lot of fun things we could talk about with psychology, addiction, and survival mechanisms of emotions and how basically any addiction is characterized by compulsive consumption and an inability to control intake. So is there anything else besides drugs, chemical drugs, that you could think of that is characterized by compulsive random spontaneous consumption and the inability to control how much you consume it. Yeah, I think you know where I'm going with that. So when you look at the brain, um, you can actually see where it lights up because it is a electrochemical organ, especially, and, and it has so many neurons, it's very easy to see. Basically what they're looking for is local oxygen you could say concentration, it's consumption, but where the oxygen is being focused. And for example, when you listen to happy versus sad music, just different parts of your brain light up. The fun thing about this is what kind of music do you listen to when you study? You don't get that kind of music when you actually have to take the test or pay attention in class or remember things, for example, just in general. And so um, you might associate without even knowing it, learning, reading, studying with something sad or something happy you can train your brain to make associations. Um, so it's interesting to see different parts of the brain light up, even with music. What we would have done at this point is probably take an emotional intelligence test. We would have found out what kind of emotional eater you are. Are you a happy eater, angry eater, sad eater? Um, how do you deal with conflict? How do you make connections? And we would deal with all those fun topics of trust and fear and bonding. And so um, emotional intelligence tests are fun to do. Um, they exist. There's lots of different kinds, and there's one that I use that's pretty revealing. And so your brain is divided up into a number of compartments. It's not just one thing. It's not color-coded like this, of course, but um, were you with me in lab and we dissected a brain, you would see it basically come apart um, in these large areas. And these are the different microcomputers where the limbic system sends sensory input. And so um, for you to understand this, uh, I'm sure sometimes you see something or smell something or hear something that excites a certain memory and then gives you a certain emotion. And so they're being sent to different places. And so this would have been an image that we would have memorized more and talked about more and done more with in dissection. So our main adaptation is our cerebrum, and this is what it's used for language, cognition, like thinking and processing, memory, consciousness, and awareness, right? So it's the outer layer, and then we would talk about those four lobes or regions where different sensory input is processed. For example, while you're looking at this and listening to me, 
you have two different parts of your brain that are lighting up. I'm using my Broca's area where I'm generating speech and you're using your Wernicke's area where speech is heard. And then if you were to use parts of your brain for listening to words versus seeing things uh, on a screen, for example, you have different parts of your brain lighting up. It's very easy to make the case that in any given moment, you're using well over 10% of your brain. That's just a strange myth. Don't know where it came from. Sight alone, as you'll find out later, uses 30%. So we've already busted that one. As you saw in the video, there are two sides, left and right, um, and they're connected uh, in between with the corpus callosum. You watched that video already, and so that's pretty easy to discuss. It's the, but at your age, at 18, 17, 18, right in there, you are starting to make those connections literally. And if I can reward you for actually making a, a, an actual connection inside your brain, that makes it even more powerful versus punishing you or putting you down or saying something mean. And uh, you need to know that your thinking and perception on life, yourself, and everything else are going to change radically over the next 10 years. There was this weird story about this guy getting a pipe stuck through his brain and he had frontal lobe damage. And so what it really affected were his executive functions. And what that means is your frontal lobe loves novelty, loves new things, is highly distractible and very curious. Unfortunately, the area of your brain that you need to light up when you need to concentrate is the exact same area. So concentration is a skill. Focusing is a skill. Some of us might be better at it than others sort of naturally, but everybody has to learn it. And unfortunately, the area where you need to learn it in is the area that is basically like squirrel, just highly distracted. So uh, have fun with that. So vertebrates actually have two types of brains. We have a large um, brain volume, no brain, yeah, brain volume to body mass ratio. Um, but what's cool is, is that the way we accomplished even more processing power is having all those folds. We created a high surface area to volume ratio for our brain. Birds did something different. They have bundled their fibers together inside their cerebrum. So they have like these units, major areas of neurons packed together like large cords rather than a high surface area. They have a different kind of brain, but as you probably know, crows, for example, ravens are incredibly intelligent. So at your age, um, you have a high neural plasticity. Our adaptation is our cerebrum and the way that we have become adapted is that we are born, not as a blank slate, but pretty open and highly modifiable after birth, which is why you go to school as a young person. This kind of shuts down or plateaus at 26 years old and then remains that way until about 50, 55 years old and then it decreases pretty severely. So you are very moldable, you have high neural plasticity, great time to learn languages, new skills, and um, I don't know, new physical things like playing music, ballet, new sports. So you've got until your mid-20s to learn how to do all that. This is where we talk about autism, where it involves, it involves a disruption of this neuroplasticity. Um, children with autism, depending on where they are on the spectrum, they become locked in really quickly, or they're not as flexible, which is what's needed to really deal with communication and social interaction. That requires a lot of brain power to be a social animal and to learn how to communicate in abstract language like we do. And so children with autism uh, struggle with this because neuroplasticity, which is required to learn very quickly about people, is kind of hampered. So as we said, lear what is learning, and you would have read an article, Why Children Don't Like School, it was fantastic. Um, learning is actually making physical connections in your brain, rewiring itself so that dopamine pathways can establish where the neurons fire and your brain is literally wired. So you know this from riding a bike and driving a car after the age of 16, if you've been driving for a couple years, you don't have to think about where to go. You've been physically altered inside your brain. 
There you go. It's pretty cool how that works. So my job is to make connections, and it's very difficult to do. So speaking of my job, we always have to play with your memory, and your memory is funny. Uh, Short-term memory, which I think most students try to live on, is stressful, but it works. It works. It gets the job done. Um, the goal, though, is not just to get through the next thing. I know it feels that way sometimes. For me, at least, I always have to keep the goal of long-term uh, modification, long-term memory, long-term learning, as long as we can get it. It's been said that students forget about 85% of what they have formally learned uh, two years after they graduate. Um, so the goal is not to just data dump, but to give you experiences, um, exposure, and that's why dialogue is so important um, because it lights up your brain a lot more than just pulling out facts. By the way, if you kind of wonder what dreams were, which we don't really talk about at length here, if you have a computer and you know what it is to defrag or if you've ever deleted things off your computer to clear out the memory, that's kind of what uh, dreaming is. Your brain sorting through the day, keeping things that it thinks it's that are important, it didn't ask you and deleting things that are not. So you've probably already seen pictures of yourself when you were like five or eight or something like that and you don't remember being at that birthday party or getting that gift. Your brain just decided that it was going to delete that because it's not important. And unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of times after school. What you learned was not made important. And so your brain eventually just kind of gets rid of it. So true but sad, but hopefully you got enough exposure. So... So there's your brain. There's your brain. Well, we're almost done here. We're going to move quickly through some things. So a lot of brain activity begins with sensory input. You need to touch something, see something, hear something, smell something, taste something. And so your sensory receptors will kickstart the brain into action. There are a number of different kinds. This is just a generic version where either you'll have an, an, an actual receptor be physically manipulated or you'll have a receptor that releases a chemical, depending on which one, if you're talking about eyes or ears or smell. So whatever this receptor is built for, that becomes the stimuli. If the receptor is a direct neuron, right, like your ears, for example, which I'll show you, uh, a larger potential coming down the wire from them or more frequent potentials means it's a more a powerful stimulus. If it's not a neuron, it has to release more chemicals. And so, for example, with touch, uh, gentle pressure, someone just barely touching your arm, you don't get a very really fast frequency. If someone slaps you on the arm, that neuron fires in fast succession, and your brain interprets that as squeezing, punching, you know, something like that. So uh, here's where we have some fun. Your, cere your cerebrum has to process this input from your sensories. It has to decode it and then recode it. And so this is where we get all kinds of information processing about touch and pressure and position. You can close your eyes and touch your fingers together. You kind of know where you are kinesthetically. And so your brain is always receiving input, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. So you can have amplification of a certain stimulus. Where basically, your brain says that's stronger, too loud, too stinky, too bright. But you can't adjust to these things. You probably know this. After a while, you don't smell it anymore. You're fine with a dark or brightly lit room. Or you're just used to a certain scenario. And so you have sensory adaptation. And you can train yourself for that. Pretty cool. Your brain can be taught to ignore things. So perception is construction. I love this picture. Um, your eyes are seeing the image or what it is exactly on the screen. But your brain is having a hard time with whether it's three or four because it's trying to make connections between the images that it sees and it's really hard to find the line where three becomes four. There are different types of receptors if you look at different types of vertebrates. Uh, we have most of these except uh, I think electro, no, uh, electromagnetic I think is what we don't have so we'll get to that in just a minute. So mechanoreceptors are usually found in our ears. Um, well, I'll show you that, but you know, kitty cats have their whiskers. And so um, your star nose mole in the beginning is an example of this. Electromagnetic receptors is not something we have. So um, snakes have that in the pit. Those aren't nostrils. Those are 
like eyes, but not for light, but for the electromagnetic spectrum, they can pick up on um, a number of things like um, electrical impulses moving in the body, and then whales can navigate this way. And snakes also have thermoreceptors, which you kind of have. Yours are actually chemically oriented if you've ever eaten a ghost pepper or something like that. So if you've ever had mint and it feels cool, or if you've ever had a pepper and it feels hot, temperature-wise, nothing's changed. It's just chemical conduction on your receptors in your tongue, but your brain interprets it as a temperature issue, and it's not. You're completely fooling your brain by doing that. What is pain? So pain is not an illusion. No, it's not weakness leaving the body. Um, you can't give 110%. What doesn't kill you can cripple you. So forget all the coaching slogans. But pain is a, um, a response to stimuli that is above a certain threshold. And so your brain will interpret that as tissue damage. I don't, I'm not talking about emotional pain, that's something psychological and something different. About physical pain, your brain is signaling that tissues are probably being damaged right now. And of course, if you ever take an aspirin or ibuprofen, it slows down that process. So the chemical receptors we have is in our nose are the same as in our tongue, and you probably can understand how smell and taste are associated. Um, I do every morning when I drink coffee on the way to Founders and I drive through 35 past the dump. And if I forget to put my recycle on, I smell the trash, gross, while I'm drinking my coffee, lovely. And those two mix and it's just kind of ruined or confusing. And so, um, but most of us smell food before we taste it. And in a way we're tasting it in both ways. To smell something means that the particles actually have to be in the air which is gross if you think about it just long enough. You don't have regions on your tongue that can taste different things. Every taste bud has all five of these receptors. Umami is that like sweet, sa no, that savory, um, it's hard to describe without using it. It's uh, like a sweet, sour beef maybe. It's kind of a combination of things, but savory is usually the way it goes. Um, but every taste bud has every single one of these. Sometimes people just don't, don't like food because they have a different proportion of taste buds. And one of the things we would have done in lab is have each of you taste the same thing. And some of you will taste it as sweet, some of you won't taste anything, and some of you will taste it as sour, but it's the exact same product. It's amazing how that's interpreted. How do you know which way is up? You've got these little statuses, these little um, kind of spheres, little balls inside of your ears with hairs surrounding them, and your body can tell which way it's oriented. Gymnasts are real good at this. I'm not. I can't tell which way is up or down if I'm, you know, flipping in midair off a diving board. So it's just a math game for me. Careful with your earbuds. They project. Um, sound waves straight down the auditory canal towards your tympanic membrane. Um, so I, I recommend you get the uh, headphones that go over your ear, but whatever. Sometimes I can hear your music in the hallways with your earbuds, which is frightening to me um, to think what's happening inside your ear. So what I want to show you is, as it hits that tympanic membrane, it goes through the three bones, malleus, incus, and stapes of the inner ear, and it'll go to the cochlea. And inside the cochlea, you have these little hairs that will bend, right? They will bend depending on the strength or the volume, if you will, of the sound wave. And so when they bend, they release a chemical which induces a action potential. And the problem is, if you bend them too far, they can break. So you've ever heard that little squeaky, uh, high-pitched tone in your ear those are one of your hairs saying bye-bye, I just died. And so over time, depending on how much exposure you had to loud sounds, you will lose um, the ability to hear that particular frequency. So if you hear that in your ear, enjoy it for that last moment because that's the last time you'll ever hear that particular frequency. So that is your cochlea, that's how it works, and you have fluid in your ears. And I love this, you can't see it in 2D, but you have one that's vertical, one that's horizontal, and one that goes at an angle. 
so that we can orient ourselves based on not only gravity, but also sound. It's pretty cool. Almost done. When it comes to eyes, there are a number of different types of eyes. I don't really hold to that irreducible complexity of eyes type stuff. Uh, there are lots of eyes on this planet. Uh, we do play with planaria, once again, if we were in lab, and they're very sensitive to just light versus dark. Whereas you have compound eyes, like those in a dragonfly or a housefly, which are basically pixelated. It's a bunch of little bitty eyes put together, and their little ganglia, their little brain, makes a composite image from that. We have a single lens eye that works much like a camera, and basically it focuses a beam of light to the back of the eye where we have a concentration of special types of sensors. And so you have rods versus cones. If you want to remember this, cones equal color. Rods are for black and white dim light and cones equal color. Um, what's cool about this is um, things to the periphery usually are filled with rods. So if you put your hands out to the side as far as you can, there'll be a limit where you can't see them and then you can see them. And I don't know if you can notice, but you don't really see color uh, to the very peripheral vision. Um, but you can see color when things become more central to you. Your eyes don't see anything. They just concentrate light. Your brain interprets the optic nerve signals and reconstructs an image. So once again, this is the ultimate version of VR. The image from the outside world is not projected onto your brain. It stops at the back of your eye. So here are your rods versus cones and what they actually look like. Your puppy dog has lots of rods, very few cones. You have lots of cones, very few rods. You don't see well at night. Why do you have so many cones? Well, we're primates and we're really good at determining which fruits are ripe, which ones are good to eat, and we need to see in color. Dogs, not so much. I won't go through this, but basically what you're looking at here is that cascade of interstellar communication that we talked about where you have an external stimulus that opens up gates that will trigger a transduction cascade inside of a uh, one of the cells of your eyes so sight is also very chemically oriented and sometimes it takes you just a minute when you turn out the lights for your eyes to adjust to dark light and if someone turned the lights right back on it takes you about half of a second to adjust to bright lights as well because it's not electric, it's chemical. And so the optic nerve just has this space in between it. Uh, the visual field of both eyes is transmitted to opposite sides of the brain and to see well, they have to communicate with each other. And I love it that vision alone counts for 30%. Color vision is, as I just said, unique to primates and a number of other mammals and birds that need to um, find fruit. And um, but color vision is actually really, really rare amongst animals in general. And so that, my friends, my dear students in AP Bio, that is your brain. I wish we would have had weeks to spend on this, but I am glad for your work. Congratulations, you made it to the end.